Good afternoon and good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, Thermal Inspection Tips for Safety's Sake, kindly brought to you by the subject matter experts at FLIR, the world's sixth sense. We've got registrants from the Maritimes, Central and Western Canada, and the United States, but whether you came here via EB or MRO magazines or another source altogether, we're glad you're here. I'm Anthony Kapkin, publisher of Electrical Business Magazine and today's moderator. Today's presenter is thermal imaging expert Jeremy Bartell with Level 1 Electrical and Optical Gas Imaging Thermography Certification. He's been with FLIR for eight years and has a background in power generation and rotating equipment. Jeremy will discuss the latest techniques for more safely conducting thermal inspections within your high voltage switchgear maintenance routine and share tools for further reducing exposure to arc flash and shock incidents. Time permitting, Jeremy will address your questions at the end of his presentation, but feel free to ask questions at any time by simply typing them into the questions section of your control panel. And with that, I'll hand it over to our presenter. Take it away, Jeremy. Excellent, very good. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we all understand that our time is valuable and precious, and I will try to keep this as uh, informative as possible. As Anthony mentioned, uh, questions, uh, we'll do our best to take as many as we can at the end, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so I am Jeremy Bartell with FLIR Canada. Uh, let's jump into this. So if you do not know who FLIR is, the name goes by the acronym Forward Looking Infrared. Uh, our primary uh, industries are defense, uh, industrial, outdoors, and uh, fire. But at the end of the day, the main thing that I do is uh, work with our customers and our applications to create uh, these types of images for pre uh, preventative and predictive maintenance in a variety of different applications. Today, mostly going, we are going to cover the electrical and mechanical uh, side of things and the safety and uh, workflow improvement uh, aspect of that. So I'm gonna go through some applications and uh, some tricks of the trade uh, along those lines. So thermal imaging primarily has been thought as a electrical room type solution, uh, though in recent years, as pricing of product has come down and technology has increased, uh, we're able to implement and deploy these technologies into many more applications, um, far beyond just the electrical room. We're, we're doing a lot more now with air handling, uh, HVAC, and an envelope, uh, as well as the traditional, traditional with electrical room, MCC, disconnects, uh, power generation, and that side of things. So if we take a look at how we are uh, implementing thermal imaging and how we're acquiring an image, uh, that side of things, we'll go back to school here real quick. The majority of the cameras that you see in the public um, or in your own industries are going to be long wave infrared, uh, focused in here around the 7 to 12, 7 to 14 micron uh, wavelength. Uh, so this is both term. We do have cameras in the short wave and then as well as in the mid wave that are used for various different applications uh, and have their own benefits uh, suited to those wavelengths. Uh, but for everything in this presentation, I'm going to be referring to the 7 to 12 or 7 to 14 micron uh, long wave. The benefit or one of the benefits here is what you see uh, in this wavelength in the Daylight is the same as what you see it in the darkness. So we are not affected at all by the visual light spectrum because we're so far to the right of that uh, wavelength. So the way that the cameras work, our photons are being emitted from targets all around us uh, and they are focused onto the detector with a lens. Uh, the detector then reacts and responds to that energy. And then we apply a algorithm to it, which is uh, part of basic level one thermography, basically uh, temperature equals emissivity plus reflectivity plus transmissivity. So all of those factors uh, bear a, uh, a weighting on the actual temperature. Then we take that calculation and we apply a value to it. Uh, so in this case, each one of these represents a pixel. And uh, in that pixel, we have arrived at a temperature. If we apply a false color palette to that, we then have a, a um, gradient of colors overlaid over the data that that represent a temperature. So in this case, the upper end of this scale is 84 degrees. So the white and just below it, the yellow spectrums uh, or gradient is covered by the higher temperatures. And in the uh, inverse, the darks are along the 60 to 64 uh, degree range. 
And all of this is relative, it's scalable. Uh, the cameras have various different temperature uh, ranges and you can adjust the span within that. So if we look at some of the images here, the, the whole reason why we wanna use thermal imaging is to address and identify when we have a problem and uh, tackle it before it becomes catastrophic. So we're able to effectively see temperature. The whole idea is to avoid uh, meltdowns, avoid catastrophic uh, issues like this, and uh, primarily um, avoid any personnel uh, injury and loss uh, secondary to the facility. So preventative maintenance, uh, we, re we refer to this as prevent preventative maintenance or predictive maintenance. The whole point of this is to reduce hazards, uh, allow us to schedule and identify when something needs to be addressed, plan for mana material, and uh, reduce downtime. So we, we know when an asset needs to be taken offline and repaired uh, versus being surprised by an unplanned outage, which costs uh, many more times uh, versus a planned outage. So if we look at some applications here, this is a, a typical misalignment problem where we're, we're basically we're following the heat. Uh, we can see that we have a gradient that is cooler and then gets warmer as we get to the bell housing of the motor. Uh, we do have this guard in place, so it does block our field of view, but then we can see the driven asset over here. We have a considerable temperature difference from 156 to 137 uh, over here. So we can imagine uh, that the coupling in here is causing an issue. Um, if the temperatures were inverted where we saw a spike in temperature over here on the left, that would tell us that potentially we have a, a driven asset, uh, potentially an input bearing uh, failure or something that's starting to decay. So if we look at that same application uh, without the guard in place, once again, we're following the heat, following the heat signature. From the right to the left, we can see that the coupling is cool in the center. Um, and our heat is actually now focused in on the uh, bell housing. So we're putting extra load into this area from misalignment potentially. This may be a axial misalignment. We would need to do a little bit further investigating uh, to this, but we're, we can confidently rule out the driven asset. And we can confidently rule out the uh, coupling in this, in this case. So looking at some uh, actual bearing failures here. So the, the whole goal here is to identify when this thing is going to go catastrophic. Uh, so we don't have men and material in place or, or personnel working in this area. That's a, that's a big driver for us here is to work from a safer distance. The benefit uh, also, as we see if the previous couple slides, we can do our scans without taking the guard off. We can see uh, the, the guard definitely is uh, in the way, but we can draw a conclusion that further investigation is needed in these uh, assets uh, based on what we can see. And here, the motor on the left, we can see that the uh, heat is centralized around the bell housing again. The image on the right, we see a gradient from right to left on an output shaft uh, where the heat is centralized, where we have the contact with the seal and then further in would be the output bearing. I do, I do have further information on this application uh, coming up. Another thing that we do is look at um, applications where we have two assets that are doing the same job uh, in the same conditions under the same load. And here we have one that is considerably different temperature than the other. Now, without doing other um, measurements as far as motor load or knowing what process is happening, what fluid or product is being moved, we can only assume that one of these is, is not, operating, not operating ideally. So they could be the motor that's running hot is actually in an ideal operating situation and the motor that is running cool on the right side is actually uh, experiencing some sort of fault. And it could be a downstream or upstream problem where we're not receiving the product to, uh, to transfer. The image in the central uh, uh, square there, that is a output shaft bearing failure. We can see the heat is centralized uh, in that case. When we look at mechanical applications, it's, it's pretty straightforward what the root of the problem is or what the effect of the problem is, but it's less clear as to what's causing that. Here, once again, we have two motors that are doing the same job, uh, but one of them has a considerably different heat pattern. 
we can also do some analysis here where we see the windings of the motor. So we can see a winding there, we can see another winding up here, and this is a good healthy looking motor. In this case, this pump just wasn't moving the product. So this motor was working considerably harder, uh, which was an ideal circumstance uh, here. The motor in the back was actually um, experiencing a problem uh, downstream of it, of its actual uh, pumping operation. Looking at mechanical applications, this is actually one of our larger carriers in the US uh, that does freight uh, terminal transfers like a, like a FedEx um, or a, a postal service. Uh, here we had a application where skids are being transferred on chain conveyors and the conveyors were slipping on the product. So the, the maintenance staff degreased the conveyor on the right, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the left side of the left side uh, square, that chain has been degreased. So it's running without lube. And actually what they were experiencing was they were able to convey the product just fine, but then they were getting premature chain failure and wear on the sprockets that were driving them. Uh, so a little bit of thermal investigation. It didn't take a whole lot of work to define what the problem was in this case. This is a better uh, time efficiency type uh, slide where we're, we're, we're doing a scan on aggregate conveyors. So in, in Western Canada, Northern Alberta specifically, and uh, you, could, you could say the same for some of the Northern Ontario and um, Western Central US applications where we're doing mining and we're moving a lot of dry product over many miles or kilometers. And in this case, these shots, the shot on the right was done out of the window of a pickup truck at speed at um, 10 kilometers an hour or so, uh, scanning many, many hundreds of these rollers at a time. Uh, the image on the left was done with a little bit more care after the first uh, fault was detected uh, to uh, get in a little bit closer and identify what the problem was. Uh, these are two separate uh, rollers, by the way. The, um, the one on the right is, is the belt slipping on the roller itself, and it's causing some heat, which is gonna cause premature belt wear and fatigue. The image on the left is actually a bearing failure within that roller. Uh, so we're able to do this quickly and safely from a distance without getting um, arms and uh, extremities into these processes. In this scenario, we're doing some machine positioning. So this is a, a large tube welding application for oil and gas pipeline. So this is a submersed arc application where the arc is not visible to the, uh, to the bare eyes uh, or the camera for that matter. Uh, just a word of caution for anybody who wants to look at welding applications, uh, be very careful. Uh, the, the arcs are very, very hot. Um, in most cases, they're about 8,000 degrees Celsius, uh, and that will destroy your, your thermal camera. So you don't want to do that. In this case, this was a submerged arc application and done with quite a bit of care. The image on the right is actually what we're seeing. The image on the left is actually just for a little bit of reference. But on the right, we can see there's three spots that I've drawn on that weld seam. This is 180 degrees to that welding area. We can see spot number one is 1100 degrees and then spot two and three are around 900 degrees. And we're using this to tell the machine in an X, Y configuration where it is on the versus the seam of the pipe that it's trying to weld. So we can do a lot more than just identify things that are hot and shouldn't be or things that are cold and shouldn't be. Uh, in this case, the center spot, spot number one, is the deepest penetration of weld and that would be over the seam. So if we saw spot two and three drift to a higher temperature, that would tell us that we're not centered over the weld uh, in this application. So it's a much better outcome than traditional. Traditionally, we would go four feet down from the welding application and scarf the flux from the weld and then do ultrasound or X-ray to verify that we've got full penetration and it's where we want it to be or where the user wants it to be. Uh, but in that case, that is a um, little bit too late uh, to make a, a difference without scrapping four feet of pipe. Uh, so in this case, we're able to do that in real time. So a little bit of some of my favorite on the electrical side. Um, I have had the pleasure uh, or misfortune maybe uh, to be involved in a couple different arc flashes throughout the years um, back when I was in power generation. So to be able to catch problems like this and um, 
do them from a distance safely and keep them from uh, um, from going catastrophic is is quite exciting for me. Um, the image on the left is a, a standard uh, set of contactors for lighting uh, for a parking lot, a big box store parking lot. Uh, so all of these should be uh, looking the same. So I've drawn box one, two, and three uh, to give us maximum temperature. You can see the uh, on the left side, uh, maximum for each one of those, 26 degrees, uh, 32 degrees, and then um, uh, 27 degrees. Uh, in the upper left of the image, there's actually a spot that I've got. It's kind of beyond the scale of this, and I'm using that as reference. Um, it's just kind of in between the box one and box two. There's the crosshair there, and that is reading 21 degrees. So what I've done is I've compared the uh, area box max temperature of each one of these against that uh, spot number one. I'm using spot number one as reference, so saying that's normal or ambient. Um, spot one is reading 21 degrees on its own and then the delta between those on um, box one is 4.9 degrees so we're 4.9 degrees above uh, reference on, on box one box two we're 11.7 degrees above reference and box three we're 6.1 degrees above reference now on their own if i was to look at a panel and see a maximum temperature like spot two of 32 degrees celsius I wouldn't raise an eyebrow to it, but in these three should be identical. Uh, we put um, uh, circuit uh, transducers on here. Actually, there's built-in circuit transducers, and they told us that all three uh, conductors are pulling or contactors are pulling the exact same amount of current, so they should be the same temperature. If we look a little bit closer at box number two, we can see that the gradient of temperature goes from white to red to yellow to teal. Uh, and in this case, I use the color palette that would be a little less traditional for me. I would use the uh, palette on the right, which is iron. Uh, in the, the left image, I'm using a high contrast rainbow to really point out uh, to the uh, site operator uh, what's going on here. And in, in this case, without a doubt, I made the conclusion that this is a loose connection. Um, it wasn't uh, pulling a lot of current and the temperature wasn't that hot um, on the cables, but it was centralized to that. So in this case, we took the, tagged it, locked it out, and basically had the electrician retorque it and it indeed was uh, less than hand tight. So if we look at the image on the right, uh, similar application, it's electrical panel. This is in a, a um, uh, automotive plant uh, here in Ontario and we were told uh, right out of the gate that uh, thermal imaging has uh, is not going to find anything in this plant. So this was the, um, I'm always up for a challenge, but this was the first panel that we opened and right away I can see two anomalies here. We can see a hot area at box number one uh, reading 71 degrees in box number two uh, a hot area uh, reading 63 degrees now in this case i didn't uh, reference a spot and do all the the um, uh, calculations i did on the other but uh, pretty safe to say here that this was a loose connection which we then verified after here we're looking at uh, more loose connections the image on the left is is far more concerning because this is a bigger uh, uh, bigger current um, carrying a lot more load uh, so we actually have a, um, it's not actually a loose connection here it's a loose connection at the other end of this so phase a so box number one is actually not carrying any current so box two and three uh, those terminations are actually doing all of the legwork uh, so we don't always find the the, uh, the cause of the uh, deficiency at the panel uh, but we we often see the effect of them uh, in this case that's the easiest uh, point of access uh, versus taking off uh, box connectors on motors and things like that. On the right, another uh, one where we're seeing a loose connection. It's totally fine to see a hot set of breakers within the, the middle of a panel. That's completely fine. But if you look at this, if you look at spot one and spot two, uh, the two crosshairs, they're on the same uh, service and they should be the same temperature going in and coming out of that breaker, but they aren't. There's about, uh, there's a 60 degree uh, reading on box one or sorry spot one and there's a 44 degree reading on the other side of it uh, and those should be identical so uh, with that we can tell that the heat is centralized around spot one uh, which would lead us to a loose connection and here i won't uh, dwell on these two for too long it's the same idea same concept um, we, we want to tackle these before they become catastrophic uh, we're showing the same uh, image here just processed differently so on the right uh, this is something that 
uh, I'm a, a fan of from a casual uh, thermography standpoint. Um, some people will refer to this as maintenance by walking around. Uh, we've got a thermal imaging camera set with a, an above alarm. So we're alarming at this level on the temperature, uh, temperature range right here. So anything above this level is gonna be colorized in red. So we can see if there's red on our target, uh, it is of concern. Uh, so it's a way to do a scan without um, uh, spending a lot of time. If it's a more of a casual application, that's something uh, to, to do initially and then spend a little bit more time thereafter and do the proper things like calculate your emissivity and reflected temperature or input those if you already have those values known. Uh, in this case, once again, uh, everything should look the same if it's doing the same amount of work. Um, I would propose to put a clamp on this up here at a safe level and read uh, across just to make sure that we are doing the same amount of work uh, as far as current draw. Uh, but pretty safe to say if you follow the heat, uh, you can find the problem. Uh, it may be a problem here at the termination or there could be a problem uh, within this uh, uh, within this disconnect. Uh, but we have a very, very hot environment. This is a somewhat a success, but a failure. Uh, nonetheless, this was done on a Friday evening uh, at a site. Uh, we detected this problem at a, a pretty casual shot. It was an over the shoulder shot. Uh, it wasn't what we were there to look at. We were there to look at thermography versus vibration and seeing if we can detect at the same level. Uh, but we took a quick look at this panel that was driving uh, the, um, this was an inductive heating, uh, inductive furnace application. So the shot on the left was taken Friday night. And after I imported these and got looking at them, I saw that the max temperature was 122 degrees on that box one. And I let the site operator know, uh, unfortunately, his electrician had gone home for the weekend. Uh, he sent me the image on the right on Monday morning and basically confirmed what we had thought of it being a loose connection. Uh, this here, L1, wasn't even tight. Uh, when they took it apart, he sent me another picture. There wasn't even a, uh, what they call a witness mark on the, um, on the copper, uh, on the copper uh, cable here. So it got hot, it overheated, it burned up and it shut them down for an entire shift. Um, the uh, irony here is this camera that we took this with was a entry level point and shoot clear, um, $1,300, $1,400 camera and they lost uh, 10 hours of production because they weren't able to, um, to address what we found with it. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, luckily nobody was hurt on that. It was just a, an after, after hours outage. In this case with process and fluid handling, we're using the cameras to set a baseline. This is a new installation with uh, greenhouse um, heating systems uh, here in Southwestern Ontario. So we're looking at hot water going in uh, to the plant, um, to the greenhouse and hot water and warm water coming out. Uh, so we're basically baselining so we can take a look at this again in six months or a year and make sure that we're seeing the same temperature as well as uh, for commissioning. We wanna make sure that we don't see any extra heat uh, in the motors, everything's working as it should. Uh, so this is a quick way to do that without having to uh, go to the extremes of, of putting some, um, some uh, circuit testers on there or circuit transducers and measure the current over time, we can actually get a, a, a pretty solid baseline without uh, investing a whole lot of time if, if that's what the application calls for. Uh, further looking into some uh, process equipment, uh, once again, the benefit of not having to be up close, uh, the uh, image on the left is a liquefied gas uh, in a sphere uh, getting ready to go to market at a petroleum producer. The image on the right is a, uh, a part of a furnace. Uh, so there's uh, active flame happening through this uh, connection and we're able to uh, just verify that uh, the pattern is, is what we want to see. This is uh, further evidence to the misconception that we can't see through, we can't see through materials uh, with a long wave infrared. Uh, most materials, not like Hollywood will make out uh, to be, but uh, the image on the right, we are seeing the effect of what's happening inside of that process tank. Uh, we can see the uh, multiple different gradients. If we go from the top, we can see the uh, froth line. This is an oil uh, tank in uh, Alberta. So we can see the froth line, uh, actual product for sale. Uh, and then we can see sediment that's gathered on the bottom. So more of a, a silt at the top and then solid sand at the bottom. Um, so it's a good way to verify that your liquid level transducers are actually accurate 
uh, you may think that you have three quarters of a tank of, of uh, fluid here, but you actually indeed do not. Um, we aren't seeing through the material. Um, I know there's different levels of experience on this call, um, so I'll keep it I'll, I'll keep it quite general um, uh, without diving in too far in some of these specifics. But we see the heat that's being emitted uh, through the through the uh, metal of the tank, and then in this case, there's actually insulation on there as well. Um, there's not aluminum or stainless steel cladding on the exterior of this tank, which a lot of people ask me about. Uh, in those cases, you cannot uh, you cannot see uh, what's happening on the on the inverse of that because of uh, physics and reflected temperature. So, uh, moving into using the right tools for the job, we I don't know if we have any hunters on the call. This is a this is a G-rated presentation, so there's nothing terribly uh, uh, wrong going to happen here, but. Um, Basically, there are, there are a number of different uh, solutions that infrared camera manufacturers uh, provide uh, to the market, and we want to make sure that uh, we're looking at all of the options and whatnot. Here is, you know, a miss. This is the wrong. Uh, this is the wrong tool for the job if you're looking for deer, unless you're looking for um, if you're looking to go to prison. Um, but if we look at some steel or some electrical applications here. Uh, some misconceptions. So uh, the casual thermographer might uh, trigger this as a as a problem, but we can go in and we can uh, verify uh, what is going on. In this case, I have taken that we saw a hot wire in this in this image. Uh, we saw a hot breaker. Uh, this uh, for the crowd is a as a uh, ground fault uh, breaker. So we can see I've put the clamp on here. And in, in this case, this clamp is talking to the camera that I took this shot with over Bluetooth. So we can actually see that that current is pulling 0.5 amps AC uh, from that. Uh, the box is reading 23.8 uh, degrees. Um, so in this case, this is a, the box should actually be on the, on the part here. But if we look at the previous slide, our spot measurement is reading 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, the coolest thing in the image is 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, based on this temperature scale. So we're actually, you know, we're showing 10 degrees above ambient. And here we can actually see that we're not pulling any current. Uh, and this is indeed a GFCI uh, breaker. Uh, so it's actually supposed to be hot. If we look at something that is a, just a standout problem, this is a hot wire with a question mark next to it. Uh, if, we, if we measure it versus the wire on the breaker next to it, we can see that it is 2.9 degrees Celsius above its next closest uh, friend here. So that actually looks like it may just be a wire that's doing its job. Uh, we can see this is done with a camera that has MSX, so we can actually see the visual detail overlaid. So we can see it's a 20 amp breaker uh, down here. So it's 20 amp breaker and it's it's three degrees basically above the, the next uh, closest one. So if I do the same thing here and I put the clamp on it, I can measure now we're reading 11.4 amps. So if we go back, that was a 20 amp breaker where you know, we're just above 50% of its load. Um, so just to define that uh, for the group, I've taken that and I've paired it up with the general tablet here that is now communicating to the clamp meter rather than to the camera. Uh, so I'm data logging that current. So this is a visual snapshot of uh, real simple data logging. So we can see that uh, that circuit goes from being at rest at zero at 135 and goes up to 10 amps. And then it maintains 10 amps till just about 137. And then it shuts off, then it turns on, shuts off, turns on. This is actually a thermostat controlled um, uh, 110 volt asset. So it's basically doing its job, it's cycling. So where it could look like we had a problem, we actually don't, we have something that's running uh, as it should. This is a little bit more uh, advanced um, where I'm just trying to show how you can use all of the tools in your arsenal to work smarter and safer. And uh, in this case, we're setting a baseline. So the idea here was to baseline a, a furnace, a residential furnace. So we wanna see what's happening over time. We wanna see how, um, specifically I wanted to show how changing a filter element uh, affects the, um, the uh, how hard the system is working. So a little bit of myth busters. So here I've got a moisture meter that is reading temperature and humidity. 
uh, it is the probe is up into the duct and I've got it uh, crude, crudely taped into place just to hold it there. Uh, second meter is on one of the main uh, conductors to the motor. Uh, so we're going to measure current on that. And here we have the whole test. So the upper bar is humidity. The second bar is that clamp meter. And the third one is going to be our air temperature over time. Uh, so if we look at what happens, we can see that the blower starts up and we see it spike from zero to about 10 amps. And then we see that drop down and steady out at about five amps. So we're gonna say our baseline for this furnace should be about five amps. We're verifying here that we're now starting to move some air because our humidity goes from 35% down to just below 20. And then down here, the exact same thing, air temperature is starting to increase. We have um, the blower is starting to move hot air. Now at this point, we took and changed the filter from a completely uh, over its serviceable limit uh, filter to a brand new one. And we actually saw something that is um, a good conversation maker. The motor started working harder with a fresh filter, uh, which is uh, in, in, it's very interesting. Uh, basically what, what it is, is a squirrel cage fan will move as much air as you supply to it to, to move. So essentially it was doing something like cavitating before where it, it wasn't operating as it's, uh, as, uh, as much air or wasn't moving as much air as it could have. So the fresh out, fresh filter uh, gives it more air to move. So we can see that spike. We can see the motor's working a little bit harder. Uh, we're um, moving more air now actually. So our temperature is actually dropping because we're moving more volume at a higher speed across the heat exchanger. And uh, we see the change in the humidity there as well. The humidity goes up because we're not heating as much of that air uh, by volume. And then we see the flame shut off and then we see the uh, the whole system shut down and this nice uh, ramp down. So we'll use this in the future to baseline this asset. Uh, in this case, this is residential, but you can draw the same similar similarities to an industrial application. Uh, so we can see, you can leave this equipment on uh, the asset and then connect to it over, over Bluetooth uh, to, uh, to get that data again. Um, looking at the specifics of working safe, uh, here. This is an asset in a concrete uh, facility that has never been inspected. It's a, um, it's a dangerous place to be. Uh, we're specifically trying to see what's happening in this area here. Um, so in this case, since we're, we're not able to be up here while this is running and shoot down and check these bearings uh, on the uh, gearboxes and driven uh, side of the drive side of things, we set the camera up on a tripod and operated over, over Wi-Fi. So the first time in, in over 30 years, this bearing, uh, this motor uh, had a thermal scan done on it. So over Wi-Fi, we're able to set up, uh, we're about 20 feet away down at ground level, and I'm able to control autofocus, uh, place my spots on the screen, basically interfacing over uh, with an iPad. Um, the camera creates its own Wi-Fi hotspot, and then we connect to that. Um, so we don't need to be in a facility with a network because uh, we're a local area network uh, provided by the camera. So here we can see I've drawn a line across the, the bearing. So this for reference, this is a four inch uh, output shaft. This is a guard here. And then to the right are uh, a number of uh, V belts that are driving, being driven uh, by this motor. Uh, but for the first time in, in over 30 or 40 years, we're able to see that this is actually quite hot. Um, you know, we're up to, if we look at spot five and spot six, we're 43, 48 degrees, sorry, 57 and 43 degrees there, uh, which is, you know, you're not going to cook an egg on it, but it is a, a drastic anomaly uh, versus spot two at uh, 40 degrees. So it's a temperature rise. In this case, it's a, it's a low speed application. We're not turning that quick. Uh, the day after we did this scan, they were they're mixing one of the largest pours of concrete for a big box pad site where they'd be pouring concrete for a couple of days. Uh, and this is, there's four of these motors that drive this facility. And uh, we're able to verify that this motor was showing an anomaly and the other three were not. Uh, so they tore that apart after hours and found that the cage uh, was completely disintegrated and all of the ball bearings were basically running down in the lower the lower half of this uh, of this bearing, uh, so they're able to get it fixed 
uh, without losing any downtime. So I've been talking a little bit about the connected world uh, that we live in here with thermal imaging. So to take a look at how we're doing some of that, uh, I, I have been doing all of this over a FLIR app uh, called FLIR Tools Mobile. It allows you connect to these meters and the uh, cameras. So the interface looks like this. You have your library of thumbnails. Uh, the, you can see an image behind an image. The image behind that there is actually a digital um, five megapixel, in most cases, uh, visual light um, uh, image. So uh, that's that. So we select the, the images that we want, and I can apply spots to that. We've got our toolbar down here, so we can tune it. Um, we can export it, uh, share it as a PDF. Uh, look up where in the world we were if you were using a camera that had GPS. Here we can title a report. Uh, the, this, this is used most often by people that uh, like to finish a job before they move on. So some of our mobile, mobile uh, contractors and tradesmen that are on site uh, only for a few hours or a few days, and then they will prepare a, a report and send it off before they leave. Uh, this works good for that. Or if you're in a, a large facility, being able to extract that data from the camera and send a report potentially up the ladder in a hurry is uh, quite beneficial versus the old way of doing things where you would pull an SD card from the camera and then uh, get that back to your computer or plug the camera into your computer and then uh, uh, create a report and then uh, share that by an email. Here, uh, we can do this in a, in a couple of minutes quite thoroughly. We can see we have all of our temperature data. And this is a more basic one. I only put two spots uh, and then a comparison on here. Uh, but we have our emissivity, reflected temperature, distance to target, all of that uh, here. And we can export that uh, in a hurry. So the three fundamentals of, of infrared. So this and the next slide are things that we need to know uh, as uh, thermal uh, imaging professionals to apply the right camera, or the right solution to the application. So we're, we're looking at resolution, spot size, and then a lot of it is uh, generally the application. Uh, these are my, uh, my top hit points. So, you know, what do you want to measure? What is the target, the scope of the application, uh, size of the, app, of the target, distance, and maximum temperature? And with that, we can arrive at uh, a camera that will get us to, to what we need most of the time. Um, it'll at least get us to a couple of different options. So with the age of small detectors and cameras at a consumer level, we can see some differences here. Basically, th this is pulled from our security side from detection, recognition, and identification. One is detecting that something is there. Uh, two is recognizing that it, it, it may be a person. Uh, three is, is uh, identifying um, potentially who it is or if they're a, a, a threat. Uh, in our world of uh, industrial, and electrical and, and many other applications, we can, we can you know, see that there may be a problem with detection. We can recognize uh, um, the type of problem, and then uh, we can identify that. So like some of the previous applications, we can identify that it is a loose connection or an imbalance, imbalance load uh, type uh, scenario. So often we're looking at uh, the differences between a couple different cameras, and the, one of the main things is resolution. So the benefit of resolution is you can do things from a safer distance by having more of it. Uh, you have more pixels on target. So if I toggle through the same asset with more pixels on target, if we look the way that this works, if you consider each one of these a pixel, uh, or in most manufacturers, we would actually have the three by three matrix within each measurement box. So we're actually looking at nine pixels that would make this up, average out that data, uh, get a median, and that's our temperature. So here we have 79.1 degrees. If we get more pixels on target, that temperature goes up. We get more pixels on target, it goes up again. From a safety standpoint, it means we can work at a much safer uh, distance. We're not on a ladder with a camera overhead. We're on the ground from a safe distance. Uh, and uh, that's the difference between a mid-level camera and a um, uh, upper-end level camera is often distance. Uh, or sorry, um, resolution to provide further distance. And then secondarily would be maximum temperature capabilities. We look at these tools that we see all the time, our laser spot meters, popular in automotive, popular in, in many uh, plant environments because they're pretty foolproof. Uh, one thing to look at is this, the spot size ratio, so six to one. If you're looking at a Princess Auto 
a spot size, spot gun, and it was under a hundred dollars, it's probably a, a six to one or an eight to one, which means one foot you're measuring, sorry, at six feet, you're measuring a one foot spot or at six inches, you're measuring a one inch spot. So you have to have your hand right up in that panel uh, to measure a one inch spot if you're looking at breakers and things like that. So if we go back to uh, some of the benefits of working from a safer uh, distance, uh, we can do that by providing uh, an optic to our camera. Uh, so here we have overhead utility lines. Uh, this is um, done with a 640 by 480 camera. We can see what we need to do is we need to get this circle completely uh, covering the target. In this case, this is completely uh, the opposite of what we want to do. This report would have said that this wire overhead high tension transmission line was minus 21 degrees. But we can see that if we look at the scale, the upper end of the scale is 30 degrees. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot warmer than what we're seeing this measurement point is. And that is because we're only halfway on. This half of the measurement is actually reading outer space, which is going to be you know, somewhere around here, minus 30, minus 40, uh, that type of thing. The, the camera receives uh, information from as far as uh, the universe goes uh, in some cases. So we need to get an optic on here to measure that from a much better vantage point and get those uh, target get those crosshairs on target so this is a difference between a 25 degree and then a 20 or sorry a seven degree telephoto so we can get much uh, a better resolution there without having to get into a a, a dangerous uh, situation here we go from a 45 degree to a 24 to a 12 and then to a seven degree so there's a big difference here between this and the standard lens back here at 24 degree you can see a lot of what's happening uh, in here. Now, in this case, we're, we're up close right out of the hop. So we've, we've got a lot more going for us, but we can see maybe it's a defect in this type of product. Uh, that's a, a known defect in here. We can, we can do more than just identify that there's, there's uh, or verify that there's something there. Here we can identify exactly what's causing that uh, problem. So if we look at some, uh, some of the image processing and enhancements, uh, here's Ultramax, which is basically we're taking a single image, uh, comparing that to that, uh, and then we take um, a stack of images uh, in short succession uh, of the exact same thing. And it's count the camera's counting on a little bit of movement uh, from the operator. And, I'm, and I don't mean the camera moving uh, left and right erratically. It's just a small amount of micro shake. Uh, and that gets more pixels. Um, uh, on different areas of the target. So here we have a, a 320 by 240 uh, detector camera on the on both of these. The image on the right is the raw uh, 320 240. The image on the left is done with Ultramax. So we've actually taken 12 shots and the camera has stacked them together. We have much finer detail down here in the in the bolted lugs. We have much better detail in the gradients. It's just altogether a sharper image. It outputs this as a 640 by 480 raw image so you have uh, four times the readings on that now if you take this now the msx enhancement if we go back to the image with the clamp meter and that residential panel we could see uh, a number of things we could read that it was a 20 amp breaker in this case what we're doing is overlaying visual light detail from the five megapixel camera onto the thermal only this edge detail though here so this is overlaid and now we can see H1A, H2A, H3A. So it allows you to identify the uh, target that you're looking at. And that's going to help for reporting and uh, things in post-processing. It also helps for a lot of people that aren't used to looking at thermal images. It helps them to identify what they're looking at without having to go to that second image that was captured with the visual light camera. And then Moving on to infrared windows. So this is, as I started uh, out of the gate with um, electrical applications being near and dear, there's, there's been a couple times when a panel has uh, had a uh, end of life experience while I was uh, near it or in front of it, um, uh, working on it, but not causing it to, um, to go into that uh, state. But because um, we we're wearing proper gear, uh, this is many years ago, but because we we're wearing proper PPE, we can walk away from that type of uh, event. But the whole benefit here is to install infrared windows. So you can do scans like I've been showing without opening anything up. You can do scans on live equipment 
without having to open the panel and put your personnel and your equipment uh, in harm's way. Sometimes what happens when you do open a panel is you disturb something that's in, in its state. Uh, if we go back to that residential panel, uh, when we took the cover off of that thing, uh, a number of knockout um, slugs fell down and ping pong through the panel because the electrician that built that house or that wired that house just left the slugs on top of the panel. So when we open a panel, we often disturb uh, the environment. So being able to do an initial scan through an infrared window is um, uh, very beneficial. And there's things that you do need to account for, like transmission loss. There's various different types of windows. Uh, there's mesh windows that use a poly, uh, a poly plastic type uh, lens. Uh, this window calcium fluoride, so it's a crystal. Uh, it is CSA rated, and, and these are CSA rated with the cover closed. So don't think that because you installed infrared windows that you can now scan um, this asset in a t-shirt and uh, rubber gloves. Uh, you only retain that CSA rating when the cover is closed. When you open the cover, as far as the manufacturer of the panel and CSA, the panel itself is open. So you do still need to protect yourself uh, for the rating of that panel. Uh, but in this case, and in all of these cases, you aren't exposing yourself to nearly the risk of opening a panel uh, without a window. I was talking about transmission loss. So different materials transmit energy at a different rate. Uh, most calcium fluoride windows transmit at about a 50 to 60% level. Uh, and that is a, something that can be offset in camera uh, with most uh, thermal imaging cameras, at least uh, the professional level and up uh, will allow you to accommodate for that. So. You tell the camera that you're working with an infrared window and you input the temperature of the window, which is often ambient, and the transmission rate, and it will let you, uh, it will uh, offset for that. Um, the last major thing that I wanted to talk about here is the next best thing to an infrared window is putting a camera inside of that panel. So this is something that is part of the, the whole connected world of smaller detectors, smaller electronics, this is basically a camera that is designed to be mounted inside of a panel, and it will watch your assets 24 seven. It will measure uh, and feedback data to a PLC. It will capture an image if it goes into um, an alarm state. You define the, um, you define the condition, and if it uh, exceeds that above or below for the threshold time, it will capture an image or capture a video uh, send a pulse out to a PLC or send an email out with an image. Uh, this is basically like having a full-time thermographer that's living inside of that panel all day, every day, uh, watching that. Uh, these are uh, quite uh, quite affordable. Uh, so we see them installed in a lot of airports and 24-hour facilities where things cannot go down. Uh, we've put them into um, rough environment um, processes like coal conveyors. Uh, things that are seeing washdown application uh, because it does have a high uh, a washdown IP rating and um, they're small and easy to deploy. Uh, so that is the last the last thing that I wanted to uh, cover there. Another thing that we do with this though is broad area um, monitoring. So here we're looking at uh, automotive manufacturing from an overhead mezzanine. So by far we are out of the scope of the um, practical use of this camera because the detector is 60 by 80 uh, pixels but there's a an area of comfort that we have here where the site is okay with an area or sorry with an error factor that is large so by that if we go back to the spot size uh, discussion that we had where we're talking about what we can see from what distance and um, if we look at that like that overhead utility these motors are what we're looking at here on the left side. So that's a motor, that's a motor, box three is a motor. These are all actually about, about 45 degrees. So there's a, there's a good amount of error here, but the pixel size at each one of these uh, from this distance, because we're at about 100 feet by the time we get to the back of this, back of this, the pixel, each pixel is the size of a grapefruit. Uh, so we're trying to get two or three pixels on each uh, motor. So in this case, we use, you know this 29 to 25 degree span as a baseline so if we see any of these temperatures get above 35 we know that something has, has gone wrong so this is a way to to help plants that have asset uh, or, or sorry uh, resource uh, um, uh, problems with being able to allocate thermographers to many many assets uh, with cost cutting and things like that at least we can still 
monitor broad areas and then basically react in these cases to a pre-alarm. And uh, we're able to do that quite nicely with this, with this uh, uh, level of product. That concludes uh, what I wanted to uh, present to you guys. I do appreciate all of your time today. Um, we'll open it up now, Anthony, if you had uh, some questions from the group. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, a couple of questions have come in, uh, so we'll get right to it because we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Sylvie asks, uh, does FLIR work with panel, panel manufacturers to install those cameras, the ones that you just discussed, uh, to install the cameras inside the panels or how are they specified? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a fantastic question. Uh, we are and we would love to be more. Uh, I, I would say that's what it is. We've 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 been preaching as a manufacturer in Canada for over 50 years, the benefits of infrared windows and getting those specified. I should say we've been talking infrared windows for probably the last 20 years. Uh, but we've been we've been working with with uh, panel manufacturers for many years, and they are installing the windows and this AX8 product. But it still is a bit of a push and a pull. the The panel manufacturer builds to spec what the customer wants. So in some cases, it's the customer requesting that. Uh, so that would be the end user requesting that they have full time autonomous monitoring in the panel. In that case, the manufacturer would put the AX8 uh, in or the infrared window. Um, and then other times the panel manufacturer is trying to differentiate themselves from competitors and offer a higher level of technology in their product. And so they'll propose that to the site, um, the site owner as a, a new technology. So it's a little bit of both. We are also seeing uh, in Canada quite a bit of panel retrofits uh, for both uh, infrared windows, uh, but more so the uh, AX8, uh, the autonomous cameras, because it is a newer product. But that's a great question. Excellent. Uh, this next question is actually very application specific, uh, but um, at, uh, one of our attendees asks, uh, can you use thermal imaging to check the wear pattern in a kiln? Uh, so I'm guessing maybe like a concrete mm -hmm. brick kiln, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very application specific, but quite quite general um, as a uh, as a solution. So we we have done. Um, we've done very much that solution with uh, refractories, so uh, metal uh, steel making uh, facilities in Hamilton and Alberta, um, where, where, where we can see the, the walls thinning in the refractory, which is a, a, you know, like a stone or a cement type material. We can see uh, where there's thinner spots, uh, the temperature is ele elevated in kilns. I have specific images of cement kilns uh, where there is substantial uh, wear uh, from from this this aggregate going through it. Um, at, that's a low rotation type uh, long distance kiln. I've got some really good images of that. And then there was another one. Uh, oh, in process, we see internal pipe wear in oil and gas applications where the process slurry is uh, heavy with sand. So you'll see it at the at the exit points of elbows or around the the opposite the outside walls of elbows where the the sand is. Um, uh, worn the inside of the pipe. So we we see that as temperature change over something that should be uh, quite linear and quite um, uh, quite similar across its its uh, length. Excellent, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, now, I also had a whole bunch of other questions that you've you've kind of covered in your presentation already okay. in terms of uh, payback over uh, you know getting some of these cameras uh, with reduced downtime. One of the things that I want to focus on, though, is that you had a couple slides there. Uh, with the title, is this a fault? Is this a fault? And it made mm -hmm. me think that education and training uh, is really important and should go hand in hand with a you know a, a thermal mm -hmm. camera because otherwise you don't know what it is that you're looking at. But what sort of education is out there for people to learn how to use their equipment, perhaps get certified mm -hmm. and and do cool stuff? Absolutely. Um, the, there, there's two sides of two sides of that coin. There's knowing what you're looking at, which is uh, knowing you know the building that you're looking at or how something is assembled, how something is put together. But then there's knowing how to use your camera. And on the camera side of things, there's a lot of things that go into making an image. If we go to the second slide about photons hitting the detector and so on and so forth, that that um, calculation, that yeah, that temperature equals emissivity plus transmissivity plus reflectivity. Or, or in varying orders. Those are all things that the thermographer needs to put into the camera. And there's many false positives that we have seen where 
uh, uh, there's no time for it today, but uh, where people have gotten that wrong because they didn't know it. Uh, so assets that are available. So there's level one, two, and three um, thermography training that is provided by the ITC group. So Infrared Training Center uh, Canada, as well as the US. Uh, if you go online, there's um, individual courses. Many are free. Some are uh, paid for at, at varying different uh, levels and different durations. Uh, but there's self-paced uh, hardware training courses that will show you how to use your new camera. There are self-paced application courses that will show you how to use your camera for indoor electrical or outdoor electrical or for building investigations. Those can all be found at the ITC site. Um, there may be other resources uh, from, from other companies, uh, but that is the, the most thorough catalog that I'm aware of. And if you go to ITC uh, training and you click on course catalog and online courses, that'll direct you there. Uh, but then classroom courses across the country for level one to three uh, in electrical building. I'm also a level one um, optical gas imaging. So that's a little bit of a fringe type application where we're, we're looking at gas that's being emitted from, uh, in most cases, electrical gear and um, oil and gas uh, upstream and downstream process. Uh, so there's probably 15 uh, solid classroom courses that you could take across the country uh, in North America, uh, as well as that self basin And, and um, there's also a pretty good resource catalog on the FLIR YouTube channel uh, that goes into some specifics on introduction to your camera, your specific camera, and then some really good application overviews as well. That's a great question. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, we're uh, pretty much out of time. Uh, so please be sure to visit ebmag.com slash webinars for video recordings of all our past training sessions and where you'll also find a recording of today's presentation in, uh, in a few days. Uh, thank you again, Jeremy, for your insights and thank you, FLIR, for sponsoring today's presentation. And uh, of course, a special thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, have an excellent day.